My name is Sharon Hoffman, and we're doing this oral history today at the uh, Atomic Testing Museum in Las Vegas. It is October 25th, 2015, um, and we're very pleased today to have our, our two guests today. Well, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves, um, since otherwise I'm liable to Butcher your names. Okay. Yeah, my name is Albert K. Z Zale. And I'll spell the last name for you. It's uh, T as in Tom, S as in Sam, E U, Zale. I'm his best friend, Sue Jerome. Thank you both for being here today and for agreeing to do this um, oral history. What I'd like to start with, Al, is if you can. Tell us a little bit about um, your history in the military. Let's start with um, specifically the um, atomic bomb test, but we can go into as much other areas as you would like to um, in the course of this conversation. Are you more interested in the atomic bomb or that what leads up to my joining the Army? Uh, why I did what I did, I mean, in going in to the military? I'm interested in all of that. Um, so maybe let's start with the atomic bomb and then let's talk about your broader military background, both why you got into um, the Army and some of the other things you did, because that was one day. Um, and I'm sure that you did many other interesting things during your career. Okay. Well, <clears throat> to start with, uh, I am I was with the 82nd Airborne Division, uh, and the um, that division was mostly in the European uh, campaign during World War II. Anyway, I was assigned there to the 82nd Airborne Division uh, to the 504 Parachute Infantry Regiment, which is the unit that that we that came over to the. Uh, the test site to do to, 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 to do to do our test in A bomb. And so we were we were in a in a um, you know, maneuvers up in New York. Andy I think it's called the, the mountain there is called Andy uh, Durandak or something like that. I am sorry I can't pronounce the name. Yeah. Adirondack. Yeah that I'm I'm from that part of the country. Yes. It's a high mountain, very cold. We had ski training there. Snow training, ski training and how to fight in, in snow combat training in snow. For what purpose? I think we, we know, but uh, probably for Russia eventually. But that was during the Korean War in 1952 that we were brought here to Las Vegas and to do this A-bomb test. And we were told that uh, it'll be twice the size of Hiroshima, the stuff that they power, and twice the size of Nagasaki, the bombs. So we came here in April of 1952, and um, uh, we were told that there's, there's going to be three miles, the closest the uh, air, troops were ever placed near the bomb where it exploded. And so we were in trenches, there were about almost, almost 300 to 275 uh, unit of people from our unit. It's the 82nd uh, the Airborne Paratroopers. And so and then we were told that we were going to jump into the drop zone too after the bomb is, is exploded. So anyway, that day of April twenty second, uh, nineteen fifty two, I can remember very, I can remember it very clearly. Uh, it was a real nice day, and so we were in the trenches, uh, not very deep, maybe about three and a half feet, four feet high, and uh, all three hundred more men were in that trenches. And there were other troops too, I was told, but I never seen them. They were the Marines, they were further back or near us. But we, when the bomb exploded, well, the bomb really was dropped by an airplane. It was like a parachute. They dropped the bomb and they knew when it's going to hit the ground, so they had a countdown 10, 9, you know, 8, 7. And then when it did hit the ground, we could feel, first of all, we felt the hot air that came in, very hot. It's like a like opening the oven door. That's the best way I can describe it. And so we we were huddled down and we went below the uh, the, the terrain where the 
bug would go over us, but the heat just came, came over us. And um, it was very hot. And about 15 minutes later, well, actually, when the bomb went off, we turned around, we looked at where the bomb was, and I saw the biggest donut I'd ever seen. You know how the, the a, a bomb would go, and it become like a rolling donut, fiery donut. And when we look up, it was right above us because we were just three miles away. We look at the flame and the cloud. It was a sight to behold for a young boy of 22 at the time. Yeah, and so we watched it go around and they said, well, then they called us and just go to the truck. So I think like within 40 minutes or less, we got into the truck and we were airborne. We put on our parachute and all the equipment that we have on. Yeah, you know, we call it battle gears, rifle, and those things that we wear for combat. So we put everything on, and we went on the airplane, almost 300 of us, of us and we went over the drop zone, and the both doors of the C-46 was open. There were about 26 men in each airplane, so there were quite a plane, uh, amount of planes in, uh, in the air. And so uh, when we got over to the drop zone, the lights in that airplane turned Green meaning jump. And so the seven jump commands were given, get ready, stand up, hook up, check your equipment, check, sound up for equipment check, and shuffle and stand at the door. I was the third man out, and I could see outside uh, where the bomb was, uh, had exploded. Of course, we were about, at the time, of a height of a pretty close to 1,000 feet, you know. And so, and then when the signal was given to jump, we just boom, boom, jump out of it there. 26 men, I think, less than 10 seconds, were out of the airplane. All 26, both doors. And so when I jumped out, I didn't feel that my parachute opened because normally when it opened, it has a tremendous burst, pow! And I didn't feel that. Then I knew something was wrong. And so usually, if your parachute doesn't open, you have eight seconds before you hit the ground. And that's pretty fast. And I don't want to go down that fast. I want to take my time. <laughs> and so I looked up and saw the parachute was not completely deployed and it was tangled above the chute and it was tangled up. So I pulled my reserve, hang on to it for less than a second and I threw it far as I can so it doesn't hit the main chute that was going like this, weaving, just swinging. If it had caught my reserve, I wouldn't have any parachute to go down it. So it caught it. And so the thing is, you know, there's no time to be scared because you've got to get things done, you know. Uh, and so it was something that you have to be calm. I don't see how anybody can panic because you train for full time for the moment to happen. So I just pulled it, threw it forward, parachute open. Then I climbed my uh, other chute that didn't open fully, climbed it by the risers, and I grabbed the string and I swing it out to free the tangle. And it came out okay. And so then I got two parachute open. And uh, as I was coming down, maybe less than oh, a few seconds later, I looked down and I saw this photographer was taking my picture completely as I landed. And I landed very close to him, not more than 20, 30 feet from him. And he was keep shooting my picture. And I was putting my rifle back together because that's what we do after we land. And I, and I remember asking, what are you doing here? You shouldn't be here at all. And, uh, and so he said, never mind, soldier, just do what you got to do. But he did take a picture of me coming down. And uh, then after we got all the equipment on, I mean, the pressure off, equipment uh, tightened up, I looked over and see many of these cages of animals. And, you know, you know they were not burnt, like charcoal burnt. They were, they were actually like uh, red, like something you, you paint over red. It's, it's there's something that I never, of course, they shaved the hair off. And so you have pigs, sheep, goats, and different animals, but they shaved the hair off. And they, and when I saw that, I saw a sheep that looked up at me because I was next to him real close. I can remember very clearly, even though it was over 63 years ago, I remember the goat looking at me, but he wasn't seeing anything because there was no pupils. It was just red, and there was, there was no eyes, actually. And I remember that, and so, and they were just like it was cooked, but it was red, not black or crispy. So, and all over me, all these different animals in cages. So we got together, we ran out, you know, to double time. We all double time anyway in the service. 
So when we got to the end, I forgot how long it was, we saw a bunch of these uh, scientists who were taking the Geiger counter and uh, going over us. I said, well, what is that? He said, well, there must be something to gauge our, uh, what do you call, radiation exposure. And so there were about a dozen of them. They were in white jackets. And so they going through our boots and our clothing and the equipment, helmet, completely over. And while it was going through that process, I asked, what is that noise? Bzzz. It was going off the chart because I saw the gauge. There's a little needle there. And it was going off the gauge. Keep hitting the end. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, what is that? They said, never mind. I remember saying, never mind. And so, so we just went back and then uh, went to our tr trucks, I guess. That was so long. I don't remember quite how we got back to base. But we got back. Um, yeah. Did they take away your um, uniforms no. and your equipment? You just kept on using those same ones? Yeah. yeah. We kept... <laughs> you know, they didn't really... I don't think they understand how dangerous it was. So they never made that kind of jump again. That was crazy. With atmosphere, was probably the atmosphere was probably laced with nuclear. I mean, you just you don't go that route, you know. You don't go there after the bomb explodes. But I don't think they uh, understand. If they did, they didn't tell us. So we went through the whole thing, and so really, I had a lot of friends that was in there when I got came out of the army. I kept in touch with them. Uh, a couple said they were dying. One had thyroid. Both had thyroid cancer. And uh, much later in life, you know, and but some died very shortly thereafter. I guess because you don't hear them anymore, you know. And so, at this meeting today, yes, nobody was there. That was my company. I would love to meet up with his buddies because we slept with them, we ate with them, we trained with them, we 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 played around with them. Of course, we we trained with them. No, I don't see anybody there, and that's just me, you know. So so they couldn't find anyone. They tried to find those people that made a jump with me. I think it was Steve Clark and some other people that worked for this museum. And they said they couldn't find any. Of course, that was no surprise because if they didn't die of radiation, they'd probably die of old age. <laughs> because imagine 1952 was, what, 60 something years ago. And so we are all in our, at least I'm in my mid eighties. And so that's a, that's a long time. So I, I probably die old age, you know, and uh, I don't have to worry about going to nursing home. I don't think I will. But I feel great. Yeah, maybe that's... Uh, but I, uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate taking part in this test. I don't have no regrets at all. It's a great experience. Did you, when you jumped, you said you could see, before you jumped, where the bomb had landed. Mm -hmm. How close did you, did you try to jump like right where the bomb had landed, or yeah, that was a purpose. That was a purpose to drop because we have to, because according to what the rumors were when we were there, they said that was a preparation for Russia to show them that the eighty second airborne is a quick strike outfit and we can get there. We can get we no, no, we can get to you. We'll drop a bomb, and we'll get to you, and we'll get to you within hours, not. You know, days because we could just drop troops off there, and that was a purpose. That's what we all kind of came up with the conjecture that that's what it was. And so, I don't know what was your question again. <laughs> that, that you answered my question. How how near yeah. to the center to as, right to ground zero? As close as they can to the ground zero it has to be. You know, that's... and from there we branch out. Yeah. And and what did what about the parachutes? Did you keep the parachutes as okay. well and repack them and reuse them? Good question. Because whenever we jump out of airplanes to in any drop zone, any training, we you know we don't pick it up. I mean, it's, it's because our purpose is to get down as fast as we can and then into combat. But we don't right. want to waste time folding a parachute. No, I mean that's not our business. Our business is to take care of these people down there that they don't uh, you know they don't mess around with America. <laughs> So you just left the parachutes oh, there, yeah. and we yeah. don't. Yeah, I think there would be detail that we'll pick it up later. Yeah, but yeah. we didn't have anything to do with it. When you you mentioned about all the animals you saw when you landed, mm -hmm. and that they appeared to be blinded and badly oh. burnt, oh. Um, were they trying to escape? Were they? 
frightened, I guess, would be the word I'm looking for? It's a very good question. They were very docile, very docile, as if their energy was spent, had nothing to, they hardly, they did move, but probably more like, um, like they were, they just didn't have any energy. You know, you see animals that are frightened, no, I think that kind of paralyzed them. They're not able to be normal, and their breathing was there. You could see them breathing, but they were not active at all. You know, they were like this, just laying down, resting. You know. So this was one day. This was one incident in your career. Um, the other people that you jumped with, you continued to be in the service with them for yes. some period of time. Yes, another couple of years. Mm -hmm. Did you ever talk about this incident? And were people were the people frightened about what they had gone through kind of after the fact? That's a good question, you know. We didn't mention one word of it. We don't talk about it. We go back to our training like it was normal, you know, normal training. And so there were no ill effects at the time, I don't think. Uh, so we were just going back. Funny, we never talked about those things, not once. After it was over, it was over. You know, it's, it's, it's just another day at the office. That's what it was. Even when the parachute didn't open, I said, well, I said, well, you know, weren't you afraid? I said, you know, that's another, to us, to me anyway, it's just another day at the office because I had that before. You know, you got to know that, that these things will happen. And when it does happen, you just do the numbers, you know. You do what you got to do. And, I mean, you don't get panicky. I don't see how they can. You're too busy thinking what you need to do. Get yourself out of there. So you... Oh. And, and Sue, what do you think when you hear this story? And what do, you, do your families think? It's well, quite a story. It is quite a story. And it's a very amazing story because of how well he has done in his life to still be as healthy and vibrant person that he is from, from what he's gone through. He has a lot of cute little jokes, but the important part, I think, in his life is his positive balance and how balanced he is in all four areas of focus in his life. These four areas are physical wellness, spiritual wellness, emotional wellness, and intellectual wellness. These are the four areas of wellness that we all fall in that category, like four wheels on a car. If one of the wheels don't work, that car not gonna go anywhere. So the four areas, physical, spiritual, emotional, and intellectual, are, would be the thing that put the person in that uh, wellness together. And so I try to stay physically fit. I, I do that. Well, you do look very physically fit, if I may say that. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Would you like to talk a little bit about the rest of your career? How long were you in the 82nd Airborne? Okay, I was there about three years. Okay. It's a three-year enlistment, and, and they wanted me to re-enlist, to go to Officers Candidate School, mm -hmm. because the Korean War was still on. But my plan, I had a plan when I was very young to join the Army, and then what got stronger, the desire to uh, join the Army stronger because I, wanted, I know there's educational benefits. And so, uh, so I got out in time to go to college and got my degree at uh, Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, and then the field of marketing and accounting. And so I just stayed in enough to get my term. They want me to stay in because uh, the, the value that I can be with them I could go to, they want me to go to the OCS, which is Officer Candidate School, and then to go to Ranger School, which is called Commando School, mm -hmm. and the Commando Type School, and then also to, to go to Language School to perfect my, actually I don't speak Chinese at all, but I do understand some, I would be invaluable as an interpreter as well, as, uh, you know, it, it's just something they want. And so if I did that, I'd probably be still be, well, not still be, but I would have been in and become a, um, a, a area where I'd be very useful in that area because of my background. But I didn't stay in. Uh, if I stayed in, I probably wouldn't be the same person I am. You know? I'd probably mm -hmm. be different. I'd be harder. <laughs> you know, you got to be. Of 
course. Uh, would you like to share a little bit about why you went into the 82nd Airborne um, at the time you did as opposed to some other service and, and why volunteer? Okay. At that time. Okay. See, I, my, my, my father fought in the First World War in France from, from Hawaii at 19 when the First World War started. He volunteered. And so he went to France, got, us, um, got seven campaigns in and three Purple Hearts. So when he got married, and when he was married to my mom, and he talked about the war, and I was very young and I was fascinated by it more than any of my other siblings. So I wanted to be in the Army. Whenever there's a, I mean, I can't remember, at six years old, I hear that Army marching song. I'd be marching with a stick, you know. I would just want to be in the Army. And, um, and so I, it, it was my you know, desire. So when the Second World War began in 1941, I, um, I was about 11 or 12 years old then, 11? Yeah, 10, 11. I've, I wore the shine shoes, fall shoes, you know, because we're, but that was back in the Depression years, where it was pretty tough. Living in Hawaii, um, there were a lot of service personnel that crossed the island because of the, uh, they go to combat in Japan, you know, Guadal Iwo Jima. So it sh we're shining a lot of uh, shoes for the GI, Navy, Army, Marine, Air Force, Coast Guard, five different branches of service, all in Honolulu, in the coast vicinity. So we were inundated, uh, inundated with you know, military people, so that influence was greater on me. And then when I saw a bunch of paratroopers, though, they're not very common, they're rare, you know, maybe 1% of paratroopers. And I asked this one soldier, I said, they were across the street, wore shiny, oh, shiny shoes of this guy. I said, who's this guy? They had these nice boots on. He said, oh, those are paratroopers. Oh, okay. And so I wanted to get close to them and talk to them, but they they were a group, but they, they just stand out, you know, they were very, um, lively group but then then I saw then I was in high school I saw this uh, poster they say wear the badge of courage which is the uh, the, the airborne wings you know yeah. you get that so I want to be a paratrooper because that, that's what I want to be it's exciting you know I never flew in an airplane because back in, in those days when I grew up even kids in my age in Kansas Iowa Kentucky wherever Tennessee they don't uh, they don't ride airplanes, go on airplanes on a trip. It's driving, right, in, in the 40s and 50s. So I said, well, I want to go to be a paratrooper. And, and the, the adventure was so great. And so when I graduated from high school, I uh, knew that what I wanted to do. So I volunteered. And there was a sign that says, in the Army recruiting office, wear the badge of courage. I said, that's what I'm going to go, airborne, airborne paratroops. So I got in there, took my basic at Fort Ord, California in 1950, August, and then got out and went to Fort Benning, Georgia. And uh, that's where I got my uh, jump training. What do you call it? Jump training, jump school, or, or airborne school. Now, now they call it airborne school. And it was a, a very intensive. But before I get into that, you got to qualify physically. There's, there's 500 points, push-up, pull-ups, um, squat jumps, um, uh, all different, different exercises. And if you score... 500 points, that's, that's perfect. If, but if you score 350, you can get in. 350 is very difficult, but I made 480 points. And I, actually, I could have done 500, but I, I won't go through that. But just that I, you know, they didn't tell me to do, uh, what they do, but they told me to do a certain amount of push-up, but I did more than that, just to do them a favor. But, it's, but then I wouldn't get any more points anyway. And so that tires me for, for my other points. Of running, you know, running with another one. How fast did you run? Two hundred yards, you know, back and forth. Well, by that time I was exhausted, but that's where I think I lost my points. But yeah, and so I got in with the training. It was so fun because these young men they never flew an airplane either. Most of them have now, you know. So how much time do I have? You have as much time oh, as you would okay. would like to yeah. talk. And so we have this uh, bunch of kids never been in an airplane. Myself, the, the highest I've ever been was on a mango tree, you know, because in Hawaii, we didn't have any four-story, well, we had four-story building, but we don't go into it. That's the highest back then was high. That was considered high. And so I climbed a mango tree, as high as I've been. And then the next thing I know, I have to jump out of the airplane, you know, but I was so proud because that was the last week of training. Uh, to qualify, you have to make five jumps within this week time. 
in order to earn your wings. Prior, but prior to that, we had a, a jump school training exercise uh, up until the last week. Uh, you graduate until we jump on an airplane. We jump on the six foot uh, ledges, land on our backs and everything, just what they call it parachute landing fall. You have to learn that. Then we jump on a 34 foot tower that was guided by line. That was that was a, a very uh, you know exciting thing to do. You're jumping out and and then all of a sudden there's a line that stops you before you hit the ground. That's a real test. And then the last week was jumping for airplanes, and uh, we all got our parachute on. And that, I remember the first time I made a jump. You know there was no fear. I was just so happy. I was the first man out at the time because the I was the first guy, and so I stood by the door and I held my the. the Look into the sky and look down, and then they say, Go! I just jumped out, and boy, that fear got into me so great. I said, What am I doing? I found myself falling. Because when you go on an airplane, you're flying at 150 miles an hour minimum, and then your propeller, the, the twin engine propeller, will blow black. It's about 150 miles, like a hurricane. You know, they call, her, mm -hmm. they call it C5, I think. It was powerful. So when I jump out, the wind, the thing swept my feet off. My head was backwards. When I shoot open, it got me upright, uh, upright, and my collarbone was raw and pretty soon the flesh was torn out from it. After the fourth jump, I could see it was real deep by that time. But I was happy. But I was scared, you know, because you know, it's normal to be scared. But after that, we got assigned to the 82nd Airborne where we trained every time when we could jump. And I uh, was able to not be scared, but a little leery, I'll tell you why. But we didn't pack the parachutes. These are packed by young men, young men that was in the riggers, parachute rigging. And we don't know how they would pack their parachutes. You know, some they could that's why we have failures, but they don't, they're not careful. But your uh you call it uh, sky jumpers or what do you call it? Yeah, anyway, these kids now they jump out of plane, but they pack their own parachutes. And when you pack your own parachute, you know it's gonna be okay. But we jump on a parachute that we don't even know. And there's there are many things that go wrong with that. So we jump with a, with a leap of faith that it will be okay. That's why we, uh, that's about the only part we fear. But once the parachute opens, it's, it's fine. And so I was bringing my camera with me to take pictures as I, as I jump out, got to the point where I can do that. And so we, so I got some pictures at home and I kept it. Yeah, so I, uh, but I was very proud of the outfit because when we were taking basic, we saw some paratroopers going back to Korea, and we, you know, and I knew I was going to be be one, you know, <laughs> and to talk to them, I was so um, excited about it because it's, I guess, it's more like if you, well, there's a lot of glory in that thing because other you know, military people really admire the paratroopers; they really do. Mm -hmm. We do things, and that is when we're like rock star, I kid you not. When I went to Fort Lee, Virginia, where the WACs were taking training, the Airborne, I mean, the, uh, the commanding officer was a female of the WACs, Women Army Corps. And on their uh, headquarters building, all these parachutes and on it. And, and so if they got a boyfriend from that, they're pretty good, <laughs> you know, pretty popular. Yeah, so the Airborne was very, very popular, uh, but rare. You don't see them very much of them. So I would be stationed at Fort Bragg and go up to New York and see the place. But it's it's a wonderful experience. And I'll, uh, boy, if I could do it again, I will. Yeah. So you only did five jumps before you graduated? Or oh, well, five well, we jumps jump from the, the airplane? Yeah, five jumps to qualify. After that, we jump every time. Okay. We, we, have, we, we have to be training all. So we made about oh, three dozen or so more jumps after that. Yeah. Yeah. Because we have, in fact, we trained the West Pointers. Uh, the uh, West Pointer that want to go airborne or be a paratrooper, they would uh, come with us into our barracks to train with us as we go out to training. And even in the jumps, they would be with us. Uh, they would sit across us. It's so expensive to even uh, drop paratroopers. But these guys, from West Point, they were the class of 52. I remember that. Class of 52 um, we were going to graduate that summer. And the we're going to be airborne, so they want to see if they're going to, if they're going to like it, you know. Mm -hmm. so, and so they, so they trained with us, and on the last day, we jumped, and they watched us jump, but they had the parachute on and everything. They got the, everything was on, but 
but they're not qualified to jail. So yeah. they sent across us. <clears throat> we were the qualified uh, uh, car shooters. And so they watched us with intensity and they see our faces, how we react. And so, but you know, we were very carefree. We we're kind of like, how, oh, what's the word they use? Oh, um, anyway, I'm lost for words. And so they get a seven jump command and they you know, stand ready, get ready up. And we, we're ready to jump, we stomp an airplane, go, 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 go. And these the young cadets the graduating that year look at us and they were crazy. Graduate. We were just like, you know, crazy people. Want to get out, go, go, go. And so when I stand up, hook up, and I was going to the door, we, we, less than a second, we go, poof, poof, they out the door. So just before I left, I tell like that, that they, they cadet, so you want to come with me? <laughs> no. <laughs> and <I> just, shoo. <laughs> Left the door, but these cadets will see if they want to do that, or, or they don't. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of uh, uh, there, so those that volunteer will have to qualify. They don't usually all get in because you have to qualify physically and you know emotionally things like that. Yeah. Would you talk to us a little bit about landing? You mentioned that the the very first jumps were from six feet to teach you. How to land? Parachute landing fall. Yeah. So, can you explain that a, a little bit? What What do you have to do to make sure that you're not okay. going to get hurt when you land? And that's a good question because see, when you when you land with a parachute, you land at thirty miles an hour. It's not a soft landing, and for people to look, because we come down at thirty miles an hour this way or backwards or sideways. So we learn how to fall frontwards. Backwards, sideways, how to roll, roll with the uh, fall, not, not to be tense, because you keep your eye on the horizon, and as you as your feet just hit the floor, just collapse and roll. If you don't do that, there's a lot of injury. Uh, people break their back, their legs, their arm, their shoulders. Yeah, a lot of them do because and and so those things are you taught to land. So, you, so we jump backwards at six foot. We jump backwards, and we, as soon as our feet hit the ground. We roll left or right or back. You have to do that. If you don't do that, you're gonna be of no value after you land in a combat situation. You gotta be okay. And so, yeah, we so we do land pretty fast, and um, and so that was how we learned how to fall. But that even with myself today, as an old person, I did fall one time. You know, I, I would jog. I hit that uh, sidewalk, the, the concrete, and I I fall forward. My parachute landing fall came automatic. I just rolled over and I, and I jumped up and I kept on running. You know, there was no break in it at all. And so, you know, people fall forward, they run like, oh, and then they land on their hand. I don't do that. I just, as I tripped, I was running as fast as I can, but as soon as I tripped, I kept myself up, but then I had to roll to, to break the fall and roll over. And that way, you don't break any bones. Yeah, that's what it was for. It's very important to learn how to land. Did you ever get hurt on a landing? No. But one time we had a, a jump that was supposed to be canceled. It was a regimental jump. And that's very expensive because you have 2,000 men in the regiment. And they got on the airplane and they were, oh gosh, maybe I, I can't count. There were about 26 people in, in an airplane. Each. So you would think of 2,000. There's a lot of people in an airplane flying at the same time. The V's the V's, you know how they are? And so at the door, I would look out and I see the, the next plane try to get the draft, you know, come down. And they were full of planes in the air and 2,000 people jump out. And, uh, but anyway, that day they were supposed to cancel the jump because of the, uh, the wind was 35 miles an hour and you don't jump at that speed. The gust was probably 50 miles an hour. Because back then in the 50s, there were no uh, weather report. I mean, no accurate weather report of uh, what the weather going to be like until it happens, you know. And so there was no satellite. Today you have satellite, you can predict it weeks ahead. And so I, uh, so that jump was not canceled. We jumped, and we should not have jumped. And most of the men were drifted away from the drop zone into trees and oh, rough terrain. And I saw myself coming down, and that was a tough place to land because it was so rocky, you know, all these different terrain. But I did so once I landed, boom, and the, and I couldn't even get my parachute in because the wind blew the parachute like a sail, and it blew me and it carried me on my uh, uh, fat stomach by at least thirty or forty yards, and in the meantime I was kicking up dirt, 
and on my face. Mm-hmm. And then, I, so what I did, I pulled the shroud lines to me until they collapsed the air, pull the air in. And I ran around and, and I throw it. But uh, that, that day, there were a lot of injuries, a lot of injuries, and there were a young man that was killed because as the parachute dragged him on the ground, uh, after the parachute dragged him backwards, he landed backwards, so his head and shoulder hit that tree stump and he found his, he was got a broken neck and he was, he was dead. He was safe, okay, mm-hmm. but when he landed, it dragged him 30 miles an hour wind. It's, so the landing is like jumping out of a truck going 30 miles an hour. Just jump it off, and what you, and that's how it feels like. You tumble. Do you have, do you have a preference for which direction you land? You said you learn to land in yes. any direction. Yes. Is if if you had a choice as you're coming down, what what direction would you choose? Well, it really the side would be better, better, left or right side, uh, forward. If you land forward, I still would have to twist myself to land on the side. So, um, so most of the time, you have to adjust where you want, how you want to land. So I land on my right side all the time. Yes. Okay. So we've talked about your how you got in and your training. Um, then eventually you went to Korea. Good question. Uh, they wanted to send us to Korea. We we're already packed. Ready to go, that was in March, oh, I forgot, anyway, it was pretty close, that was in 1951, and they already made two parachute jumps there in March, that's right, though, in 1951, two airborne units went there, they gather all these guys that want to go airborne, and train them, and then take them over to jump, but the 82nd were really a train outfit, for, not just put together a bunch of guys, they were, we trained like a team, so we kind of take one and, it's, it's like a team, and um, and so uh, we were ready to go, but then it canceled, and everybody was so disappointed. We wanted to go, you know. Now, these are the kind of men that if you said to them, "Would you go over and uh, drop in the, at night into Hitler's compound and, and you know, do a, a killing, you know, stuff, invasion of them?" I would say, all of them would say, "I want to go." These are the kind of kids they were because they, they like to take chances, they do things like that. Um, and so, yeah, but anyway, they cancel the order because they feel that it's like an ace in the hole when you play, you don't want to play the ace, it's just a waste. But we're trained for a specific purpose, and that was for Russia, because at that time the Cold War was really strong, and they needed a unit that the Russians are watching and they don't want to mess with, get to mess with America. And so we were trained for that purpose, and so we did. So the orders were canceled. I was disappointed. I had my bayonet all sharp enough, and I was so excited, you know, that we were going to combat, you know. No, that was canceled. But we would love to have gone, but but they they uh, didn't want to waste that troop because they just send freshly uh, uh, young people basic training after basic training. They send them over, and like you know, for, um, you know, to be killed, and, but to be trained. To be parachute, it costs a lot of money, you know, and it's a special purpose for a special mission. And so that's why they didn't send us over. They had to cancel. In fact, we want, I want to quit just to go over, but they don't want us to quit. So they kept you in the United States, yeah, and training. they just kept you training all, all the time, time. for went, whatever might happen. Yeah, you know, we went to Panama for swamp training, and we did well there. You know, because other troops went there and they couldn't do well. But because it, it's, a, it's a physical condition of, of, of the men, the, the you know, determination. And it's just pure type of different type of group of people. And so, for instance, now, the, the swamp was crossed in th- something like, was it 30, 30 hours? The airborne unit went there, we did it in less than 12 hours, half the time, probably better. And so that's the kind of men they were. And so they, you know, so we train in swamp, we train in the desert training, we train in ice train, um, sea training. So we knew every, and those are expensive training. I don't think any troops were trained like that. They trained for one mission, go to a Korean fight. You know, so we were trained for those the special, the unique situation. And so I'm very glad that I went airborne. You know, really, I'll never forget those moments. You know, in, fact, in fact, I never landed in an airplane until two years later, when I went home with furlough, 
because every time we went in, we had to jump out, you know. So I said, so after we landed, so you know, anyway, my uh, friend and I said, hey, is that how it feels to land in an airplane? We never landed on one. We had to get out one way ticket. <laughs> So is there, I think we've covered a lot of territory, is there anything else that you would like to share that you would like to um, record for posterity about your service? Okay, I'm glad you asked, because I, I would say this much. I think I've learned to love America so much more, how noble this country is. Of course, we have our bad you know, things, but by and large, we're a great country, and I would fight for this country anytime. You know, even though my ethnic background is Chinese, if, if America went to war with China, hey, America is my country, my people, my home, my friends, my church, and my culture too, and I would not hesitate at all. This is my country. I'm, I'm so proud of it, you know, and so I, yeah, I would, I, I would, uh, Oh, I would do that again. You know, I just so, and you know, do you know why these the Iraq soldiers quit so quickly? I thought about it. You know, you know when they fought when America went over there, and even today they surrender quickly. Not that they're cowards. I think it's because they have no deep love for the country. There's nothing to fight for. They go back to the country and they got tyrants ruling over them. Whereas in America, all that I am, I owe to America. I I really mean that. And I love her. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's why these people in in Iraq right now they're they're good fighters, but but they don't love their country. That's why they that's why you can't depend upon them. But the Americans, I think you can. Because they have a reason to fight. They're good. Because they love their country. The country's been good to them. They're, they're, they're the country of, I mean, all that we are, I owe to my country, America. So, sorry. Well, I, I want to thank you so much for everything you've done for your country and, your, and for sharing your story with us today. It, it's uh, very um, enlightening to see, you know, what you went through and how you made your decisions. I, I really appreciate all the details that you have shared. So I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you if there are some stories maybe that Al has shared with you that we did not get to today that we should ask him to share. Well, I'm not sure, but it depends on what part of his life. But the one thing I thought was interesting when he told me, when I asked him what nationality he is, he says, birthright, I am 100% Chinese, but I am 1,000% American. That's right, yeah. yeah. And uh, I think he learned through his heritage to not be a coward. He told me a story about when he was coming home from school as a child. The bullies were going to, you know, do what they could to him. And he could tell the story better than I can. But as I remember it, he, his first thoughts were to run. But no, he couldn't because that's cowardly. And he stood up to them and took good care of them. And they never they never bothered him again. And I, I think he can tell the story better than I can. But I that was something that I treasure yeah. that he shared with me. I was only six years old, my first day of school, second day of school, and because I was smaller and I, I was shy, and they picked on me. I was six years old, and in school they picked on me, and I, you know, and I didn't know how to react to them. So I, there was a second day. I walked home, and I looked in the back, and I saw four to five boys chasing after me, and. At six years old, you think, wow, this is terrible. You know, you want to run home. I did run about no, no, no more than five yards. And I said, wait a minute, why am I running? i got to tell my mom that I ran from this, for this the trouble. I turned around and I, and I ran toward that ran, but I walked fast toward them. They were about three blocks away. I walked toward them and they were running. And as I met them, I, I, I felt that I need to face them. 
and that's a decision I made that I was, you know, if I'm going to get beat up, hurt bad, that's fine. As long as I know I didn't run, run from them. And I remember that. So when I went home, I never told my parents, though. They don't know that. Even today, they, they passed on. I never said what I did, but I stood up for myself because I know I will never run from, because it's, it's just not in me to do that. Yeah, if I'm going to die, well, it'll be okay. I didn't know at that age that I, I'm not going to die. But so after that, the bullies never bothered me. Yeah. So as small as I was, I tackled them. You know, I, I went a little just like a wrestler and beat up on them. And so the uh, girl was only in fourth grade was because I knew her. She was a neighbor. She said, okay, boy, stop now. And so we listened to her. We were kids at six years old. We listened to old people. So we, we just didn't fight anymore. But I felt good about myself. And I, you know, that was an experience I had that I was thinking, what would children do today? Even the man, you know, you know they get natural incidents to get away from them, but I turn around and face them, you know. That is an excellent story. And I thank you for sharing that one with us as well. Is there anything else that you would like to make part of this history to, to talk about? I talk myself out. <laughs> I don't have much to say anymore. But except that I'm, I'm grateful for this country, and I'm glad I, I'm an American, because I, I think all that I am is because of the opportunities this country has given me. And I think this country has a destiny, and it has a destiny because God, is, His hands is on it. As I said, we, if you were there at the talk I gave, you know, we were a continent that was unoccupied, reserved for America. And God knows the end and the beginning. And He knows He has to have a country that is stable, that people that love freedom, liberty, and would foster growth in individual. In Europe, it was already like the old wine bottle. You don't, you don't put new wine into old wine bottle because it'll break. This new people are from America, from all different nationalities. We bring them together as a fabric and uh, make it stronger. And then you, and then we have things that God has the purpose for this country. We rescue a lot of countries. They ask us to come over to, to help them, and we do. And even though we, oh, you know, and the atomic bomb, yes. as deadly as it is, as cruel or as bad as it is, it's the most, uh, it has saved many lives. Now, think for instance, now Hiroshima, I think the population there at the time was about 250,000. And, and when they dropped the bomb, 600, I mean 60,000 to 75,000 died. It's horrible. Yes, it's horrible. But you know something? It's the most merciful thing that Japan can ever had happened to them. Because they, they didn't, if we didn't drop the bomb on them, more Japanese national would have died. Because America would have bombed and, and bombed them to smithereen and caused more death. And then our troops would have died by invading them. So in a way, in the hands of a good nation, atomic bomb can be wonderful, a, 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 a tool for peace. And I think that's what it is. America uh, you know, is stronger because we need to be. If we're weak, I think today we don't have that kind of uh, the strength anymore a will to fight, you know, to be strong, militarily, we have to be, because our purpose is always a rightful, a righteous principle. We're there to help people, not to conquer and to occupy like other nations does, where they, after they invade them, they take over all the resources America gives back to them. You know, you can't help but think, there's no nation like that. What other country would do that? If, if Germany took over America, we'd be speaking German. It would be, it would be under them and be in terrible tyranny. Japan, same thing. So America, free people. Korea is doing so well because America was there, even though they, there was a war, but we, we helped them. Japan, you know, I'm going backwards. But Germany, East, East Germany, they're very prosperous through American influence. You know, so they're very generous people. You know, and God is very pleased if we are righteous and let's hope that we are, we stay good and then we'll be together. But if we're wicked, then we'll be destroyed from within. So 
America mm -hmm. has a destiny. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.